Hey, it's me, Chris Ryan, co-host of The Watch Podcast. If you're a fan of the show, there is a new Spotify feature that lets you automatically follow the show. Tap the bell on the show page to get notified as soon as new episodes are released. This could come in really handy since Andy and I are releasing The Watch on Sunday nights now, immediately following Succession. By turning on new episode notifications, you'll also automatically start following the show. All the latest episodes from shows you follow can be easily accessed in the What's New feed on Home. Now let's get into The Watch. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible. Thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. From your morning podcast to your afternoon playlist, State Farm knows you personalize your entire day. And that's why State Farm helps you personalize your insurance with the State Farm Personal Price Plan. It offers coverage options that help protect what you care about most at an affordable price just for you. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Prices vary by state. Options selected by customer. Availability and eligibility may vary. I need support staff to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRinger.com and joining me on the other line, he's thrilled that Batman has entered his welcome to the Black Parade phase. It's Andy Greenwald. Is that where you're going with this? Do you feel like this is the emo Batman? I mean, I don't know if he's going to be emo, like he's going to be standing at the front of the, sh- of the show with his bike messenger bag, like nodding his head and crying. But he looked real Gerard Way with it in the trailer. We're going to be talking about the Batman mm-hmm. trailer today mm-hmm. on the Watch Podcast. We're going to be talking a little bit about why The Last Man getting canceled. We're going to talk a little bit about The Last Duel flopping. We're going to talk a little bit about Succession popping. Mm. It's it's all happening here. We don't have like a single thing we're talking about. It's kind of a grab bag. Andy, how are you today? Great. I'm great. You know, um, it, it's funny. I remember last week, when we made the decision to record our Monday pod as a Sunday night pod, so we could just just revel in succession, which was which was the right call. I was thinking like, what are the odds there's going to be news? <laughs> and then like in the next three days, all the stuff happens, and the IATSE strike doesn't happen, and we should right. talk a little bit about that. So I feel like we have a head full of steam. We have a bunch and of things to discuss. It's all popping off at Netflix today too. Yes, I am in my office, which is you know. You guys know me, right in the center of things, Hollywood baby. Helicopters buzzing overhead as uh, Netflix workers. I don't know how many. I haven't seen the latest, but there's a there's a walkout going on. There's a yeah. lot of lot happening. In yeah, town. over Netflix's handling of the fallout following Dave Chappelle's The Closer uh, special. Why don't we start? Well, I'll tell you where we can start because there's so many things to talk about. Let's see if we can just get, get it, let it flow. I wanted to tell you. I'm going to pull a Greenwald. Because over the last couple of episodes, every once in a while, you'll just be like, I just want to let everybody know I watched this. I watched this thing mm. on Criterion. It was so good. I cannot recommend something more highly than I do the Todd Haynes Velvet Underground documentary. I agree with you. Did you see it? Yes. Oh, my brother. Yes. Come on. <laughs> you thought you were just going to be solo on the mic? Yeah. You want to know why? Because when yeah. I was just like, FYI, yeah. this documentary is blowing my mind. You were just yeah. like, great no punctuation, which is how I respond to you when you were like, have you ever seen this Norwegian guy who talks to his wife? (laughs) Wait, what? Isn't that that the guy you like? The Finnish guy? He's like, hey, my wife. (laughs) (laughs) All this time, hold on, pause. All this time, I have been good, sincerely and genuinely recommending the brilliant filmography of the (laughs) Finnish maestro Aki Korosmaki now streaming on the Criterion channel, you thought I was just kind of like side-pitching you the Norwegian Borat? That's what you thought I was doing? Do you think I point on the package? I'm honestly about to start crying. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. I mean, it's like we've been friends for a really long time. I think we both know when to, when the button's getting pushed or not. I always let you cook when it comes to Kurosaki, but I was just like, Kurosaki, you Kurosaki. monster. <laughs> I, I, will, I let you go. I let you rock. But like, I just uh-huh. haven't seen any of his work, you know? And I, I just get the feeling you're really into relationship stuff that you would just be like, this <laughs> yeah. guy is like, me and my wife on a trip to the lake, whatever. It, 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 first of all, not that at all. Not that at all. A lot of, lot of sort of sardonic class observations, you know, which is, which is more up your alley. But by the way, you're the one who's like, if there is a filmed entertainment where two adults are screaming at each other for 90 minutes, I am all the way in yeah. past the popcorn. So I don't know why you're turning this back on me. I'm into relationship stuff. Here are words you've never heard me say in this order before in this podcast. Scenes from a marriage. I know. Never <laughs> once have those words escaped my lips, nor will they. So I feel like there's some projection going on here. Okay, let's circle back because, whew, yeah. The Todd Haynes Velvet Underground documentary on Apple is incredible. It is incredible as a documentary and as a film. Yes, please listen to Todd Haynes on the big picture with our boy, uh, Sean Fennessy. They had a wonderful, long conversation on the most recent episode or on Tuesday's episode. So I went into this. Uh, Velvet Underground is one of the first bands that I like truly fell in love with. When I was working at a record store, that was right when I started working at a record store is when Peel Slowly and See, the, doc, the big box set came out. So they were kind of... Um, like kind of memorialized as mm-hmm. like, this is maybe one of the most five or six most important rock bands of all time. They have so influential and all that. And I felt like, you know, more or less over the last couple of decades, I've learned their story. I've obviously listened to their music tons and I know a fair amount about Lou Reed and John Cale and Mo Tucker and Sterling Morrison and Doug Ewell and like the records that they put out and the context in which they put it out. And more than that, I think I was very, very familiar with their influence on so many of the bands that you and I both love. Uh, mm-hmm. Sometimes an incalculable amount of influence where it's just like if you're playing any kind of like alternative slash indie slash underground rock, whether you like it or not, you're kind of influenced by Velvet Underground. And I was so thrilled once this documentary started to see that that is not that story. It's yes. not really the story of, of like what they wound up creating after their breakup, it's literally the moment in which they existed and Todd Haynes efforting to basically recreate through multimedia and through an overwhelming amount of visual and audio stimulation what it was like to be a part of seeing them live, which is a quite a feat since there is essentially no footage of the Velvet Underground playing live, especially in the John Cale, Lou Reed peak. What did you think of the doc? I mean, there are a lot of different ways into it. One, I just want to reiterate what you were saying that, that, you know, we love to, and maybe this is the equivalent of like, you know, fish tales or something, but like, we love to talk about how we discovered the things that we love and how fundamentally different it is as a, just as a way of processing, as a way of learning, as a way of becoming than what is available now, thanks to the internet. And there was mystery in good ways and bad ways in our lives coming of age as culturally interested younger people in the 90s and Velvet Underground was like words you heard whispered or referenced or or mentioned casually in a parenthetical in a Rolling Stone review. And I think my introduction was hearing REM's cover of Pale Blue Eyes on their B-Sides collection, Dead Letter Office, which leads you to maybe see if you can find a used CD of the greatest hits and whatever. They had no hits. Best. I think mine was Cowboy Junkies doing the slow version of Sweet Jane from the Natural Born Killers soundtrack. And, And so there's always going to be for us that that incredibly uh, exciting thrill of discovery connected to finding the the main vein. Like that's probably a bad metaphor for for the era and for the group, but of of a lot of the music and the art that we came to love. But that is not the same thing as understanding the moment that that birthed them and the cultural forces at play that created them. And what I was so struck by in the documentary was exactly what you're saying. It is not back padding backwards looking. It is in the moment as it's happening, trying to understand what it would have felt like to be 20 in your 20s and disaffected and wanting to be artists, but not sure what art is. And all of it is on top of each other in New York City at this, you know, post this kind of uh, uh, moment of great upheaval in the society. It's also just what I what I also love is I'm not we don't ever really talk about documentaries. Very rarely do we talk about documentaries, and very rarely do I watch them. Frankly, except, that's that's except for Thousand Foot Wave, yeah, Hundred Foot Wave, <laughs> which is the greatest thing I've ever seen. So maybe this is uh, maybe this is my mistake, but I think it's partly because I can't 
you know, I don't pay enough attention to separate the wheat from the chaff, and I'm not really sure what what's what in that in that world or in that space. I think that when it comes to music documentaries, I rarely scratch that itch just because in my mind they are at their peak, and I haven't watched all of them. Like I think we talked briefly about like the Bee Gees one from a couple months ago and on HBO. And I just really enjoyed that because it had a perspective and a point of view and great access and interviews and footage. But it didn't feel complete. It felt like a little bit of a nudge of like, hey, here's something you hadn't thought about or some footage you hadn't considered in this way or whatever. Um, it didn't necessarily tell me anything new or make me feel anything different. And I, I cannot stress enough how much this is a film. Like Todd mm-hmm. Haynes made another movie and except he didn't write a script necessarily. He just had this footage and this idea. It's, it's, it is itself so artistic and that it's completely, it really subsumes you into it, you know, in a way that really makes you understand. In, in, in some ways, it's a, it's a movie about an idea more than a band. And it's, it's mm-hmm. a, really narrated best by John Cale at the beginning where he's talking about how, so John Cale played bass and viola in the Velvet Underground and and was a very accomplished um, avant-garde classical musician as he sort of was then getting involved with rock and roll through Lou Reed. He lived at this place on 56 Ludlow, which is down in the Lower East Side. It's like an apartment building that was full of like performance artists, avant-garde filmmakers, musicians, like Tony Conrad, all these people who were experimenting with like drone music and microtonal classical music and all this stuff. And then this fucking doo-wop kid from Long Island is like, I got some songs. And they were like, why don't we try to make these two things go together where you get these unreal tones of like just overwhelming, monotonous, sonic boom drones on top of Lou Reed's like pretty perfect pop songwriting. And, you know, they were just such a unique proposition. It really made me miss, I think, that, that itch that, you know, honestly... TV can scratch every once in a while where you feel like, boy, am I seeing something pretty, pretty transgressive or I'm seeing something Mm -hmm. really, really like I don't like often see in the world. Like, you know, in some ways I thought like I may destroy you got into this with like, it's sort of um, the way in which it tried to represent traumatic memories and and kind of a portrait of a mind grappling Mm -hmm. with that kind of thing and doing it with filmmaking. There's other examples. I'm not saying like TV is... but that's not really what TV is supposed to do. You know what I mean? Like, that's not really what the medium is supposed to do where it's like, you know, if you get, if you get a bottle episode, you're like, whoa, curveball. How about that? But like, this is, we're talking about a band in 1965 that like, not that many people liked, not that many people saw, but the people who liked and saw them were like Andy Warhol and these incredible New York City intellectuals and scenesters and hipsters and dipshits and everything. Shout out to... um Shout, shout out to Connor Roy. And uh, yeah, I just thought it was an incredible documentary. If people aren't familiar with their music, I still think they get a lot from it because Todd Haynes is just like playing at 11 volume on this one. There's also something that's kind of thrilling, I think, and transporting to watch it from this particular moment because it is a window and a window without a screen, like you just right into it of a time that I think you and I have We didn't live in, and 60s were a very problematic time for a hundred different, thousands of different reasons. But what the, what the documentary captures and what the best of the art from that period does capture is a moment when, um, the pursuit of art and of radical art and of seeking truth through art was happening in the public square and was happening in the cities and drawing people from all over and drawing people not necessarily all from a uniform background. You know, it's not, like the way people joke that, you know, all comedy writers come from Harvard or or, or all uh, modern fiction writers go to Iowa or whatever. Like John Cale grew up in Wales in a household where his grandmother didn't let him speak English. So he couldn't speak to his father until he t- learned English in school at seven, you know, and Lou Reed was just a Jewish kid from Long Island. And it just, none of it made sense to him being there and he wanted something else. And so there's a, a very different attitude about the purpose of art and what it shape it could take where, you know, within the first 10 minutes of this documentary, Andy Warhol's in it, but they talk, and they talk about Eric Satie, but they also are talking about like, you said it, you alluded to it, but like the doo-wop groups that were on the Mm -hmm. radio in the fifties and And the stones and and blues rock. Yeah. Yeah. It's all on top of each other in a very, you know, in a way that feels uh, like it's, it's always a little bit greener from whatever side of the fence you're on, but it, it feels very different from our cultural moment now. And, I'd be lying if I didn't say that was part of the appeal. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, 
So one of the interesting things that comes up is like they're talking about all these people living at this apartment on Ludlow. And I think that they said that like one of the things that unified a bunch of the people who were there was that they did not want to participate in the economy. Right. And that they had found an apartment, I, I'm sure, in a what was then pretty rough neighborhood in New York City for $25 a month. Now, you can probably scrounge together $25 a month doing all sorts of things in New York City, and I'm sure they did. But that is just like not the way most cities work anymore, especially the bigger ones in this country where you could be a, a self-styled starving artist where you could be like, my, my principal obsession with my life is to create things and I will do just enough to like get a roof over my head because like they, we're just not, we don't have an economy now that allows you to sort of tap out. Yeah, but also nor is there like a middle space or even a less than middle space, right? Like you could potentially at different times in your life eke together a living playing some shows and contributing articles to a few independent journals. You know what I mean? Like sure. As as, as veterans of the last great independent journal era of the internet, I feel like there's nothing like that anymore. Yeah. So so we end up in a moment that's much more feast or famine. In Barbarian Days, the William Finnegan book about his life surfing, uh, and he's a New Yorker writer, but like all of his sojourns into like um, Asia and Australia and stuff, he will essentially just like bang out a travel article for, for yes. you know, whatever outdoor magazine was back then and just send it off in, a, in an envelope. And then like six weeks later, it would get like $80 in the mail and it would just be like, cool, I can like eat and drink beers and, and fix my surfboard for the next two months. It's it was a different time. Um, so, what do you want to talk about first? You want to talk about why the last man or Batman? I, I want to talk about both those things. Since you did a personal thing, I do want to make a small. I, I forgot this. I wanted to mention this last week, but I feel like our listeners might enjoy it. Um, you getting into Borat? Bringing it back. I feel like there is a Scandinavian take on it that is dynamite. Um, no, I, I just listened to something I really enjoyed and really surprised me, and I feel like our listeners will dig it too. Nick Offerman you know, from Parks and Recreation and um, from Devs is interviewed on the Ezra Klein podcast. And I just think people should check it out. Chris loves it when I recommend other podcasts on this no, no, podcast. No, no, I just he knows love, I, don't. I just want it. Here's why. You, here's why. You saluting the, the Ezra Klein flag is just, it's an amazing like. <laughs> here's why. Because Ezra Klein is at the New York Times now and it's kind of wonkish, you know, usually political stuff. He has Nick Offerman on and it's really thrilling because Nick Offerman is on there to ostensibly to talk about his new book, but his new book is basically about considering the American experiment while on a hiking trip with his best friends, George Saunders and Jeff Tweedy. And Nick Offerman is also really good friends with the great writer and agrarian Wendell Berry. And he has very, very, very cogent opinions about the food system in America. And I, was, I, I love listening to him talk. I think he just seems like a fantastic intellectual guy. But also, here's the other reason why I enjoyed listening to it and why I recommend it to listeners of The Watch who may or may, who probably enjoy his acting. Um, I was listening to it being like, God, I just, it's a wonder why many actors sit through like interviews, <laughs> you know, because what was there something I was reading, even like a, I'm sure it was fair minded and I've done this too. I was an interview with um, Brian Cox. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, sorry, this is going to contain a very small spoiler for the Succession season premiere that aired Sunday. Hit skip ahead 15 seconds. If you don't want to hear it, we won't reference it again. But someone asked him, and this is the phrasing, why did you pick Jerry as the new CEO? And he was like, well, blah, blah, blah. I think that blah, blah, blah. I'm like, you didn't do anything, Brian <laughs> Cox. You probably have opinions about agrarian food ways. I, I, maybe you do. Maybe, maybe you read something good in the New Yorker the other day. I don't know. But like, it was really cool to hear someone who we love for doing one thing actually be engaged in what he sure. had to say. Sure. That's awesome. Speaking okay. of being engaged in things we have to say, let's pivot to the Batman. <laughs> okay. So we had kind of just, I guess we're, we're on the Batman beat. I feel like Matt Reeves has got us. He's got our attention. <laughs> okay. He'll Matt have Reeves. to have our attention for three hours when he puts out this movie and it's very long. The trailer finally came out, the full trailer. Mm -hmm. They're still hiding the Dano, which is... Uh, mm. I think a mixed blessing. I, I understand, you know, the, the being the Ricardo's trailer also just came out and I felt like they, they used Nicole Kidman's voice, but only quick shots of her, not like a mm -hmm. full Lucille ball. Like here's, here's Nicole Kidman doing it. Dano's obviously the main villain in this movie. I think the Colin Farrell's transformation into, um, I think somebody compared him to old Jake LaMotta in Raging Bull, but is not, you know, he's going to be maybe part of other 
spin-offs or later movies H- but HBO I think, Max series. Yeah, the Riddler is the is the main thing here. What did you think of the vibe? Very I wouldn't say gothic but kind of um you know, it it actually reminded me a lot of I, I know they shot it in London and it did feel like Dickensian only in that like it seems like there's just like an impenetrable fog over the city and that this, you know, it there's a little bit of like almost like um I don't know, theatricality to it, but it's not in the not in the sort of Michael Keaton, Val Kilmer way. I, I think that I want to reference a Batman villain that is not in this movie when talking about it, which is uh, the great Two-Face, Harvey Dent, played mm-hmm. by your man, Aaron Eckhart, in Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight, um, also played by Tommy Lee Jones, and in a pre-acid transformation uh, by Billy D. Williams in the original Tim Burton. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. In that I, I, I really have split feelings about this and I'm struggling to toe the line. It will surprise no one that my main takeaway from this trailer was one of deep, deep moral exhaustion (laughs) that we're doing this again and that it's so fucking dark. But we're not doing it again. We're not gonna do his dad and his mom. But just the just the being down in the electrified, filthy puddles of Gotham beating the shit out of people. Like, I, that's just not where I'm at in my spiritual journey, but I want to acknowledge and hold space for those who are still, you know, really punching it out in the trenches. That's cool. So I I, I definitely was, was torn. I think that my choice is to consider this to be an upcoming dark crime, urban crime film directed by Matt Reeves. That's that what is, you like. I'm I think that's holding, what he wants. Holding to that because the opening shot of the trailer, you know, in this very like Blade Runner-esque hopper painting influenced uh, image of a diner with the colorful neon lights reflected in the rain. Like that was a beautiful shot. And that shot alone is prettier and more evocative and compelling than anything I've seen from Eternal so far or other big budget comic book movies of the era. Okay. Like it's just, I, I think that's awesome. Mm-hmm. And then Paul Dano is drinking coffee, which, you know, I like to drink coffee. So I'm in. And he's got like a little barista's flair with his. Also, Chris, not to, you know, our podcast isn't serialized. You needn't have listened to every episode to get the references, but he's definitely drinking his coffee help. after when we dinner open time. up with Finnish filmmaker talk. I think it helps. Well, but that's a recurring <laughs> bit for us. My, my point is he's drinking the coffee after 6 p.m. Like a true mm-hmm. super villain like me. So I connected with that. Um, beyond that, there's just, you know, there's just there's just a ton of punching in whoever's playing Alfred this this month, and it's Andy Circus looking concerned. So I, you know, I this is it's it's also just worth remembering, and I'll I'll, I'll clear space for you that this was the trailer cut for and released at like the DC like the fan dome. Yeah, don't don't act like you don't know what you're talking about. Don't be like, is it the the fan house? What is it? You you were like a a gold past member of the DC fandom. You were like, this Black Adam trailer just dropped on my noggin. That's you. You're laughing, but you know that you are. You know that you're like, I got the fucking, the quick go pass to get to the front of the line for all fandom experiences, virtual or otherwise. Yeah, I have an Aquaman alert on my phone, just like at all times. Anytime anybody even pretends to talk to fish, my phone blows up. There was a, the Black Adam like featurette that they did, which is like six minutes long. And it's like everybody in the cast is like, it's like Aldous Hodge is like, I'm Hawkman. And I was yeah. just like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> and it's like so many minutes of just people talking about what an honor yeah. it was to be a part of the Black Adam experience. And then The Rock is standing in like a CGI fandom, essentially. He's like in the middle of like a, a cube from Squid Game. And he's just like, folks, our long journey has arrived at this ending point where I am going to deliver Black Adam like I've been promising for a, I, a decade and a half. Like, I, what the fuck is Black Adam? I, I have to be real with you. Prior to Warner Brothers' breathless announcement that Dwayne The Rock Johnson would be finally bringing beloved character Black Adam to the screen, I had never once fucking heard about Black Adam. And you know, I'm the guy, I'm on here explaining like the deep intricacies of different Moon Knight iterations. Like, I will... Go to the fandom when necessary. I have access to yeah. the fandom. I have sources yeah. deep, deep inside the fandom. You know what I mean? Like I have Kellyanne Conway leaking off record to me from, from the executive club inside of the fandom. 
I never heard of Black Adam, but but I do wonder if there is a Godspeed. Maybe that's better that the no one has very few people. I think have a lot of. Um, it seems like he's like an angry god who gets woken up. Who and gets then woke? Just, yeah, woken no, not up. woke. Like I, I mean, like gets I, awoken. I, to, I'm into to, both versions. Yeah, that would be cool. I, 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 I kind of would be here for the ultimate. If like Black Adam was just like beating the shit out of Ted Sarandos. <laughs> If it's Black Adam versus Barry Weiss in the final battle. Um, I'm really here for, I, I don't know if there's, I don't know what the example of it would be, but like a star, because there really aren't that many stars at this level like The Rock at, anymore. But he might be our someone, president next. What's that? He might be exactly, the, pre- but, the next president of the United States. But we are at a place where a major, major, major star can just be like, you know, I always fucking love Pace Pot Pete. When I was reading the Marvel comics, like that was my dude, the dude who had the pace pot and fought Spider-Man. And like Kevin Feige would have just a blank document with a signature line and a hundred million dollar check the next day. So is this all, what if this all was just a bit? You know what I mean? Like just, yeah. Rock was just like, let's do this. Fine. Cool. Great. Well, you're, you're dodging, by the way. This is, you're well, avoiding how- commenting on the Batman trailer. You know, I don't mind Batman beating people up. I don't take that to be like, that's not like oh, where we're right. going man, as a society. Man of the people. This is Gotham's finest over here. Um, okay. Yeah, it's. I tend to give Matt Reeves the benefit of the doubt. That guy made multiple movies about apes that I was like, this is pretty good. So if you yeah, need to take a Batman yes. movie, I think I'll probably be into it. I agree with you. My big thing is like, just watching guys deliver body blows to one another, I think I'm like out on, you know, I'm just like, let's let's like elevate our game a little bit. But I, I don't know. And I'm interested in the Pattinson experiment. He uh, he seems to have pleased fans with the voice, which I, I, I give him credit for. It's a, it's a hard thing to do. Um, How the fans feel about the hair? Uh, I don't know. I mean, like the because My Chemical Romance of, contingent were like, yo, this is tight. He's kind of rocking a fan dome of his own. You know what I mean? Like over <laughs> on, on the old headpiece. I like that guy. I sure. Zoe Kravitz looks great in the movie she as, as Catwoman, right? <laughs> Don't say it like it's some exotic pearl. Yeah, you could. <laughs> you've heard about Catwoman. Yeah. Like, is um, it a Black Adam? Is it pronounced Black Adam? <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't read comic books. I only read memoirs of surfing. Okay. All right. This is a punchy show. This episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. New Year's resolutions are fun the first couple of weeks. Then you kind of maybe conveniently forget about them halfway through January. No shame. It happens to us all. But this year, I have a foolproof plan, at least when it comes to saving money. Just switch to Mint Mobile and you're done. Goal accomplished. Because for a limited time, their wireless plans are 15 bucks a month when you buy a three-month plan. The great thing about Mint Mobile is there's no jaw-dropping monthly bills or unexpected overages, and all plans come with unlimited talk and text. Get this new customer offer today at mintmobile.com slash watch. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Let's talk about Why the Last Man. Yeah. So Why the Last Man is a show that Andy and I talked about the first couple of episodes a few weeks ago. And I think both were like, I, I think it was fair to say just sort of not super enthused, which is n- no knock against it or anybody who likes it. Uh, but it was like, I think we talked about mostly because of its unique trajectory or its new unique trip to the screens because it had been this uh, frequently developed, frequently sort of um, or argued, you know, not argued, but negotiated over property for a long time. Brian K. Vaughn and Pia Guerrero's graphic novel, highly influential graphic novel. And, you know, finally gets to screens after multiple mm-hmm. showrunners recasting the, the, the main character, essentially, and uh, a COVID delay. And has aired, I think, six episodes, I believe. Six or seven, yeah. Six or seven episodes. And this week was announced, or last week, it was announced that it would be canceled. It would not be, re- yep. it would not be brought back to screens at FX on Hulu, which is not the, same, not the same thing as canceled. You know, Eliza Clark, the showrunner for the show, uh, put out a very passionate statement about what the show is about, how, what, what a labor of love it was for her, how she has a vision for five seasons of the show. And we'll like strive to find a new home for it. People have suggested HBO Max could be that home since there's the DC Vertigo connection. And then uh, I think yesterday, Leslie Goldberg in The Hollywood Reporter put out a piece that was basically like, here's the, here's the scoop on why this happened. This was really a matter of 
there was a, a deadline, an October 15th deadline, I think, for FX to pick right up it. everybody's options in the cast. And this was a cast, many of whom had been sort of on the books since, who knows? I mean, 2018. Eight, 18, yeah, right. Diane Lane has been like a paid member of this cast for a very long time. And FX just made the call, I, essentially to cut bait for financial reasons. Is that fair, you think? I think it's extremely fair. And I think that um, more than any other reason, that's often the culprit here. And that's at the root of a lot of things. I well, Money's at the root of a lot of things here. I learned that from Finnish films, by the way. That's the kind of... I learned it from sharp, John Cale and Lou Reed, yeah. Great. It's the kind of sharp-eyed cultural economic commentary you've come to expect from America's most consistent cultural podcast. A um, couple things to comment on here. One, um, shows getting canceled, especially this way, it sucks. It sucks for everybody involved. It sucks for fans who've been investing their time and hopes, especially fans of the comic book who've been waiting for a long time. It sucks for the cast and crew who've been laboring over this for years. The season two writer's room is well, well, well underway, if not close to being completed. Um, I can say that, you know, I, I had high hopes for future seasons, mainly because it employed my good friend and co-executive producer on Briar Patch, Eva Anderson, who tweeted that she was a part of the room. So I'm not breaking any embargo to say that. Um, I also have to give a lot of credit to Eliza Clark. Thrilled to be thrilled to be in a uh, community with her of um, showrunners who scoop their own networks. <laughs> <laughs> because let me say, networks love when you do that. When yeah. you grab the narrative and tweet it yourself, they're thrilled. Um, yes. So I think my first reaction was really kind of shock. FX doesn't work like this. No network really wants to work like this, but FX, one of the things that has kept it, kept its, kept its, its brand, uh, not just alive and thriving, but kind of golden has been their very deliberate, very careful, very creator focused, creator forward relationships. And it's very hard to think of series that they have just outright canceled. First of all, generally they're like, this will be the last season or we, you know, we, we've agreed to pull the plug or whatever. Beyond that, they never, no one, ever anymore cancels series in the streaming era. No one ever canceled series in the middle of a season. If they could have done this any other way, they would have. But as Chris said, it was all financial. They would have to pick up the options at the cost of multiple millions of dollars for the cast for a season they clearly weren't sure was in their minds financially worth committing to. This is another ugly and public example of what COVID did to the industry. Obviously, these are not life or death issues, mm -hmm. but generally the the deals are made within a time window you know the year a year for the option or whatever a few months extension to allow for the possibility of the show to end find a second home find second set of eyes maybe have some award buzz and then they'll be financially free to make to make their decision free of the finances of do we have to commit to another whatever or not covid pushed everything to hell and that that simply wasn't possible I think I also know, though, that FX has consistently said, and, and you know, I don't know whether Nick Grad said this in the time he was on our podcast or John Landgraf has said this publicly many times, that even as like Nielsen ratings have fallen out of favor, they in their, you know, very consistently managed executive suite look at certain factors for everything. And it's a, you know, it's a proprietary blend of cultural engagement. And I don't know whether that's like, are people tweeting about it or mm -hmm. on a deeper level, uh, awards consideration critical feedback and consensus, which I think is often a sign of whether there's room to grow here or whether there's a potential of getting awards further down the line. Uh, and then, yeah, whatever viewership data is possible for these things. And so I think the main thing here is it's not that complicated a story, even though it was done in an ugly way. The things they were looking at, it wasn't meeting it. Yeah. They, they did not feel it was making sense from a that potpourri grab bag sense or from a financial standpoint, considering what it was going to cost them. So, okay. I have, but, oh, okay. Sorry, that was a big monologue, but also to say, yoinks is my other response <laughs> because it's kind of, it feels kind of like a black eye for the network in a way that I'm very curious. I'd love to hear them talk more about it. Hey, executives from FX, come on the podcast and talk about it. Um, just because as we've detailed, it felt, feels like there were many opportunities to cut bait on the show. Maybe after Melina Mansuka shot an expensive pilot that they then scrapped and redid. Um, only to have to walk away from the table now feels um, that's probably why it feels a little bit unkind and cruel, even though maybe we never should have gotten past point A that you brought up, which is the show wasn't fully working for us as casual fans who might be interested in it. Um, and at this moment, 
it's very, very hard to base a successful long-term broadcast strategy on wait till we get to the parts we're excited to show you. Mm-hmm. It's it's really tough. You cannot count on that. And if it didn't hit the ground sprinting in this environment, it's probably not going to make it to the finish line. So I have, I, here's, here's a, I want to, I want to throw an idea at you and you tell me whether or not you think that this is true. Are we about to enter a phase of TV, big budget TV, where sometimes these networks are just going to have to take the L? Because I was thinking about this with our buddy Zach Barron wrote an amazing mm-hmm. piece in GQ this week. It's in the, in the magazine, but it's went online this week about Wheel of Time. He went to, uh, Prague or outside of Prague, frankly, um, to visit the set that they had essentially Amazon went and built a studio outside of Prague to film Wheel of Time. Mm-hmm. It is an amazing story because Zach basically details about this thing is really, 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 really hard to do. And if they're successful, all of these people have to live in Prague for 10 years making the yeah. show. <laughs> yeah. Like your reward is you live outside of Prague and stand in the mud for 10 years. And he details about how like Amazon has given the showrunner Rafe Judkins upwards of 11,000 notes on the first season, which Zach does the math of like what that would transfer to. Like if you were just like a note per, it was like essentially like a note per minute Mm -hmm. uh, or more six notes per minute. And you know, they have like a, it's obviously like there's a huge investment being made by Amazon. So I'm sure lots of people over there are getting a peek in on the product and they're already on to the second season. They're already shooting the second season. But let's just say, let's just say this comes out and nobody cares. Yeah. Or let's just say this comes out and people get an episode or two in and decide it's not for them. Amazon might just be like, we tried. Here's the second season. But like, we'll see what the numbers are after two years. But maybe not. Maybe we're not going to make another huge promotional push. Maybe You're we're right. just going to let it be the hardcore fans. I think it's harder than ever to launch a show like that and why The Last Man maybe not as huge, obviously not as big budget as Wheel of Time, but a beloved genre uh, nerd property, right? Mm -hmm. And also a dense world-building exercise that is hard to, um, I don't know how to put this, catch up with. You know what I mean? Like if you're going to catch up with it, it's not like watching a bunch of episodes of You're the Worst, you know? It's it's like you got to really like, Be like, okay, I'm going to watch an hour long episode of of like these storylines spread out across this dystopian, you know, Mm -hmm. future. I don't know. I mean, I I wonder whether or not we're going to get to the point where some networks might just be like, you know what, we tried, but better to have tried and lost. Well, I I think to that last point, I think that's also one of the reasons why the why prognosis was trending negative, because even just sampling fan reaction to the degree that I was able to, everyone, me included, liked aspects of the show very much but it was doing that first season thing which i understand i'm not sure how not to do it but it was doing that first season thing where it's like well we like ashley roman's character but also we're going to be with yorick and the monkey and then also we're going to be in dc and we're not sure which of these is popping off yet but we're going to get to a place we've decided that's also you know we have from the book and the appetite to then let's say it gets amazing in season two to go through season one with the storylines that even the creators at that point had realized weren't working. I mean, that's an ask. It's an ask of time that people just simply aren't willing to spend anymore. To the second point, I think there's a lot at play there. I think that um, the willingness, the appetite for just eating shit, (laughs) for lack of a better term, is a lot different between an Amazon and an FX. Now you say, well, FX is owned by Disney. It is now. I don't, I'm not certainly not privy to what the conversations are like between the new Disney brass and the old FX regime. Who are I'm sure they're not, get, and they're also not getting like the Mandalorian's budget, you know? No, nor are they getting the support. It, you know, maybe they like it that way or the watchfulness, you know what I mean? I think there's still, I think probably one of the arguments for FX's continued existence as a kind of prestige hub in the larger Disney system is here's what we need. We've seen our track record. Let us keep doing it. And we'll get you onto the podium and we'll get some eyeballs and we'll drive traffic to Hulu. And that's the deal, right? So um, I just feel like FX simply can't lose money like an Amazon can. And also, fundamentally, they're in a very different business. You know, if, if we had, if we ever had, I know people, I saw some feedback that people want us to be doing this. Like if we have a like ask a line producer segment, like the the amortization 
whatever numbers for if you commit to two seasons in Prague versus X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. I'm sure those are pretty compelling for people who can decipher that stuff. But I think fundamentally, again, this is based on, we know nothing about the quality of Wheel of Time. Hopefully it's great. But I do think that the, the, the way that Amazon looks at the expenditures and the potential value for two seasons of an adaptation of a globally beloved best-selling fantasy series, when you also sell books, um, is, and you are pushing your service into every household in. I totally forgot that. I was like, oh yeah, that's right. They do so. Well, right. I mean, they, it, that's, that's, that's almost a rounding error to them at yeah, this point, right. but it, it is a thing that they have and that they do. And that I think Jeff Bezos feels is an important part of their identity still. The value of that, I think, is very different. You know what I mean? Like Amazon Prime Video is trying to be, they're trying to push into every corner in the world and a fantasy series, two seasons of it, which I think is a plus sight unseen to get people on, to get new viewers. I think that that is on a different scale. But I think your larger point is true and stands. Like this is, I mean, we, we joke about being in the great game now. Like this is like Pacific Rim level combat where mm -hmm. just to enter into the arena you have to build what are those kaiju what are those things called those giant oh those are the bad guys but like you have to build an incredible like a billion dollar robot fighting suit that's exactly right at a certain point yeah we are going to start to see these giant robot fighting suits fall and collapse into the ocean in a very public and messy way like amazon is going to be because they are also market driven and shareholder driven and at a certain point they're going to be like nope mm -hmm. no we're not, I don't, and I think at that moment, we will see that aspect of Netflix, of like of a Netflix, that, the, the aspect of the industry that we have seen more recently in a Netflix where they are not sentimental. And it feels a certain way when they're not sentimental about Glow, something I'm still ticked off about. And it might feel differently when Amazon is suddenly not sentimental about Lord of the Rings, which they spent, you know, half a billion dollars to secure and make. You know, because I, I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about The Last Duel, the Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, Jody Comer movie that failed at the domestic box office and it only made like four and a half million dollars and a lot of obituaries being written for adult films at the theater and how this is going to be the end of that because they just couldn't get people to come out and see this Rashomon like movie set in whatever 16th century France or whatever it is. I, the reason why I'm correlating the two is because it's interesting how now there's just such a fluid metric for success in each one of these mediums, even as the mediums start to collapse on one another. I'm, Last Duel is something that quite obviously you should see on a huge screen. It's got incredible battle sequences. I haven't gotten a chance to see it. I'm hoping to see it this weekend. But like, would probably be, have benefited from being available to a lot of people, 35 and older, who maybe have kids and don't have the wherewithal mm -hmm. to get out to the theater for the weekend or interest but would love to see something new with Ben Affleck, Jody Comer, and Matt Damon on a Friday or Saturday night on their streaming service of choice. We can debate that, but it, I've just been kind of thinking a lot about that because so much of this most recent batch of TV series news, both in Zach's piece, the cancellation of Why the Last Man, upcoming Lord of the Rings, like all these things, a lot of the Marvel stuff where, you know, that's also been delayed. You, you mentioned the pandemic, but a lot of it is also like, how much did they spend to make this? Mm -hmm. And... For some people like Netflix, it just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter what they spent to make it because they'll just make some more stuff or the things that really make them money, well, you'll never really see it coming and it'll be Squid Game and all of a sudden they have a billion more dollars than they did on Friday. Which apparently we should make note of this. There was some great reporting over the weekend that... From uh, Lucas Shaw, who's been on the show before. Yeah, at Bloomberg, like, yeah. Apparently Squid Game maybe cost $21 million all in budget to make that show. And it's a value add, which is an amorphous term of like upwards of $900 million to the service. Yeah, like I, I honestly don't understand how, I guess that's just how it works. But like, if, if like, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it just, it's, it's, it seems like it, it makes sense to Netflix and Netflix gets to dictate their own met metrics. But I wonder whether or not more networks will start to imitate that kind of like throwing good money after bad because, you know, who can tell? Who can ever do the accounting? But I think it, it, you, there's a, always going to be a degree about that, a, de a degree of that to this. But I also think that this is, and you could draw a bright line from us talking about like, you know, John Cale contributing to journals and playing Eric Satie and how you can't do that anymore to where we are today because yeah. you actually can. This is late stage capitalism at its finest where- You're in the great the fandom old, now. <laughs> for real. The old way of understanding if something was popular was that it would be on TV and people would watch it. And then you would kind of be like, that's how many people watched it. So people like that. And 
your real way of understanding how valuable it was is then like Dove Bar Soap would be like, here's a million dollars to talk about Dove Bar Soap while LA Law is on. And NBC was like, cool, bet. People like this. People who like to be clean like our show. We understand it. Now we have a million dollars or whatever. For Netflix to say this is a $900 million value add is nonsensical, but it also makes sense in the shareholder economy where it's like everyone around the world is talking about the show. Everyone around the world now has to keep their Netflix subscriptions for another month. Does that is that something you can actually quantify? Were these people actually going to cancel it? No, but yeah. they might have, and they didn't, and we kept them. So please keep our value up, Wall Street. Like all of that, sure. That's, my mom, that's what we're talking about. When I got back to Philadelphia, my mom was asking me about like what, like basically, it was like explain how Dune is on HBO this week. And I was like, you're like, it started with the spice word. <laughs> I was <just> like, <laughs> first. <laughs> There's Fanny and Freddie. That's a, <laughs> no, that's a happy endings joke. But no, it's like you have to get like, I, I couldn't do it. I essentially was just like, they're counting on Dune fans who don't have HBO, which I'm sure there are dozens, getting HBO specifically for the purpose of watching Dune and then keeping HBO perpetually, right? Well, that, but also it's the keeping it perpetually. It's the, well, you know, I really enjoyed having HBO for In the Heights last summer, but man, I've just noticed it's really adding up on my bill I think I'm going to can't, oh, oh, I can watch Dune next week? Okay, I'll keep it for another week. That, that passive Because I love keeping, Lin-Manuel Miranda and Frank Herbert's novels. I can only represent myself on this podcast, Chris. I, I am an audience of one. But yeah, that's, that's kind of like delicate. It's the keeping. Not, oh, it, it's not just the acquiring new subscribers because as we learned from the Netflix, um, I think that, that they announced, I think their, their call is happening now while this big walkout stuff is happening, but their earnings call. But I think that, the number of subscribers they added in North America was relatively modest. And mm-hmm. I think that's continuing proof that everyone who has it, everyone who's going to have it has it. Like there's not a lot of opportunity for market penetration for Netflix here, just like there isn't for Kleenex. You know what I mean? Like we get it. Where is the growth coming from and how much are they willing to spend to keep people in their tent who might otherwise flee to Disney or Amazon sure. or whatever. Um, but you were But you were talking about something else and I stepped all over it. Oh, I, you, was it? You were, you, it was last dual talk, and um, I, my, my takeaway from that is concern. I mean, we talked about the Russo brother. The one Russo brother had a comment. Not unclear I believe which it was, one. I believe it was Joe. I think it was Cooper, but had a comment about like that audience is never coming back, right? Like the the um, the middle the adult movie audience is never coming back. That really might be true. The my last dual thing takeaway was um, I feel like it's pretty destabilizing because uh, you know we are look we are not maybe we need Conrad and Mickey from industry back on because we are not the dudes to talk about like arbitrage or arbitrage or I don't even say the word like I don't understand arbitrage yeah arb arb call it arb I don't understand any of that shit but the idea that Matt Damon and Ben Affleck and their partnership was money in the bank and like marketing megastars they waited from Goodwill Hunting until now to like do it again. And now we know it's not just that it was like a Rashomon like story with, you know, about dueling. They're just not really movie stars in the way that they used to be anymore. No, no, no. They're famous. Here's my counter right? to that. What if this movie was Matt Damon and Ben Affleck as two Boston dads having like a midlife crisis and they go on like a road trip together? Well, but then the ceiling is much lower. I think that that's smart. First of all, they should. May do that, and someone should buy that and make it. But the budget on that two Boston is dads what, who rob a casino. Okay, see now we're getting off the okay, rails. Like yeah. if it's just they go on a road trip, and it's even that should be half of this. But if that's a forty million dollar movie, okay, I see it. But this is a two hundred million dollar movie and a period movie, and Ridley Scott wants this, and everybody else wants that. Like then you get into that place where in the economy of the modern movie, it's not it's not going to work. And I think about like almost 10 years ago when Grantland launched and Bill wrote that piece about the movie star. And it was mm-hmm. about, is Ryan Reynolds the best we can do now as a movie star? 10 years later, the answer is yes. Ryan Reynolds is a movie star. He opened Free Guy to like $200 million, right? right but like, we just don't want to accept insane. it because it's Free Guy. Because it's, yeah, it's, think- it's not Indiana Jones because it's not whatever, Top Gun. But it's a, it is it is absolutely a weird moment, and I think that the people, younger, slightly younger generation stars, like there was a moment when Chris Pratt came out, you know, in Guardians of the Galaxy, he's a movie star in Jurassic World, he's a movie star. I think that Chris Pratt or his team correctly market market corrected himself 
where he's like, yes, I am a movie star, but also I'm going to do a TV show for Amazon. And like, I'm going to keep, keep it moving in all the ways I have to keep it moving now because I know how slippery this is. It's not like I can follow any model from 10 or 20 years ago where I do a big budget dueling movie or whatever. And then I do my Oscar movie where I'm on a road trip with my dad. Right. All that stuff is meaningless now in a way that is still, and I bet our listeners feel otherwise, but I feel like it's still kind of surprising to us for some reason. So we saw that movie and I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. We should probably wrap up here. Succession, by the way, we will be back on Sunday night to recap uh, episode two. Uh, so I hope everybody will join us there. Thanks for listening can, this past well, Sunday. But I want to talk a little I do, bit about its success. Oh, you want to do that now? Yeah, sure. Well, what did you want to say? Oh, I, I had one little other news story to just keep an eye on before we got back to, before oh, sure. we ended where we begin next week. Just that, we referenced it at the beginning. Huge sighs of relief breathed this weekend when the IATSE strike was seemingly averted for people who don't remember the conversation we had about it or haven't been reading the news, IATSE is, a, it's a union, it's a collect, it's basically a collection of unions that represent a vast majority of the people who work on film and television crews, from editors to camera crew, everybody in between. And this would have been catastrophic for the industry and also something that is was really overdue because the IATSE team was basically saying, this has become increasingly inhuman, the way that we're being treated and ground up and spat out to make all these endless hours of content, particularly for companies and streamers who don't appreciate our labor, don't value our labor, and also take advantage of loopholes in the old agreement to underpay us for our labor, which is not something I mentioned last time and something I was even aware of, which was apparently, you know, like everyone from like Peacock to Apple could basically be like, we haven't been around long enough to have X number of viewers. Thus, we don't have to pay you your full market rate. Oh, Jesus. Even though we are Apple and Universal. So anyway, people thought a strike was imminent. It was going to happen on Monday over the Apple's weekend. Like, look, we, we sunk a lot of this change into this Velvet Underground documentary. We just don't have overtime. <laughs> Sorry, we had to fly to Wales. Um, strike averted. Like the head of IATSE was like a Hollywood ending. People were relieved and thrilled. It felt really close. All I wanted to say is it's not over. Um, the agreement has to go back to the various guilds and be ratified. And from what I'm hearing, and I, this has been reported as well, membership, particularly younger membership, are not happy. Um, they feel like there were some not significant gains, more like rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic stuff. Mm -hmm. And that this was the moment with a really engaged, vibrant, super plugged in, like I think it was 97% voted to ratify yeah. a strike if it was necessary. This was the moment for like existential generational change. And which, you know, I think now the new agreement is yes, you can have 10 hours off at night. <laughs> and, you know, in Europe, they get 12 hours more everyone in a crew. Does that cost studios a lot more money those two hours? Yeah, that really adds up. But also when you're working for, you know, 30, you know, 20 weeks on something, your 10 hour turnaround time, which isn't even really turnaround time because you have to get there early to hang the lights and you also have to drive home and you also have to feed yourself or see your family. Like it's pretty inhuman. So I'm not saying it won't, the strike won't be averted, but I, I've been surprised from talking to people how much the appetite is still there and how disappointed some people are with the deal. So it's worth keeping an eye on. Yeah, for uh, sure. Obviously we'll know more in the next few weeks. We'll be back on Sunday night. I, I don't really... The succession premiered to its best ever numbers. I think it was 1.4 million people watched it on Sunday night, which... <laughs> it finished like 44th in the ratings. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a popular it, TV show. I think I was just going to mention just, it. It's just funny to see that. We're, we are seeing a little bit of the slingshot effect of the band being pulled back while everybody watches and rewatches and gets ready. I think that there was like a groundswell of interest in the show coming back in a way that maybe like you could go back to say Breaking Bad when that was kind of like building and building and building over seasons and people were re-watching it or watching it on Netflix. So fascinating to see the trajectory of where that will go. Uh, we'll be back on Sunday night. We were produced by Kaya McMullen for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> Kaya had to go at the end. We are off the chain right now. First of all, Kaya is the Ayatsi of this podcast. <laughs> we gave her very little turnaround. We'll be back at it tomorrow talking about Succession. And because we like and respect Kaya so much, we won't say things we shouldn't, even though she's not minding us right now. Okay. Uh, thank you to Andy Greenwald, as always, for all oh, his But I want to. No, nope. <laughs> okay, I won't. I won't. Talk to you guys Sunday night. Bye, Baranskis. Bye.